folks. Good evening. Sorry for the delay. Uh, welcome to the April installment of the St. Joseph's Businessmen's Association's feaker, spe featured speaker series lectures. We're streaming live from Historic McCabe Theater on the campus of St. Mary's Academy and College in St. Mary's, Kansas. It is our great pleasure to be able to welcome to our meeting our guest speaker and his staff and those of you joining us through the internet. Before I introduce our featured speaker for this evening, I would like to ask our chaplain, Father John McFarland, to lead us in an opening prayer. Thank you, Father. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now, and the hour of our death. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost. I lay seed of wisdom, St. Joseph. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Thank you, Father. AMA was founded in St. Mary's in 2001. It's a lay organization of Roman Catholic businessmen who are guided by the social principles taught by the magisterium of the church. The organization places itself under the spiritual guidance of the priests of the Society of St. Pius X, following the spirit of Archbishop Marcel Lefebvre, defender of Catholic tradition. If you wish to join the SJBMA or sign up for our monthly newsletter, please go to sjbma.org and follow the Become a Member links you will find listed on the website. Monthly meetings are held here physically in St. Mary's, and guest speaker lectures are streamed live over the internet for our membership. Our guest speakers are just that, our guests, and do not necessarily condone, agree with, or hold any of our views, or vice versa, in all of our views. The, the list of upcoming speakers is posted in our monthly newsletter and on our website. Some of our future speakers are Dr. John Rao, professor at St. John's University in New York, and Mr. Christopher Ferrara, head of the American Catholic Lawyers Association. Some technical notes con concerning tonight's talk. If you're viewing this lecture online, you can type in questions for the speaker in the comments box on the right of your screen in real time throughout the talk. Mr. James Vogel, editor of Angelus Press, will moderate all online questions. After our speaker is finished with his lecture, he will open the floor for questions, I believe. And as our online audience wouldn't be able to hear otherwise, we've prepared a podium here at the front to come forward and ask questions. It's a little bit awkward. Uh, we may forego that if the questions come quickly. So, uh, but we'll try it there, just coming to the podium, asking questions so the internet audience can both hear and hear the question and the answer. Uh, once the questions come to an end, we will bring the meeting to a close. Uh, now finally to our featured speaker for this evening. Mr. Chris Kobach is the 31st Secretary of State Institutional Law at the University of Missouri, Kansas City, for 15 years. Secretary Kobach graduated co-valedictorian from Washburn Rural High School in Topeka, Kansas. He went on to earn his Bachelor of Arts degree with highest distinction from Harvard University earn a doctorate in political science from Oxford University in England, and earn a Juris Doctorate from Yale Law School. He has since published two books and numerous articles on elections, political science, constitutional law, and immigration law. As a White House Fellow, Secretary Kobach worked in the personal office of United States Attorney General John Ashcroft. After the 9-11 attack, Secretary Kobach has testified before Congress multiple times on numerous topics, he also has been a frequent legal commentator on several news programs 
including the O'Reilly Factor and Fox and Friends on the Fox News Channel, Lou Dobbs tonight on the Fox Business Network, and Talk of the Nation on National Public Radio. In addition, he has been a frequent columnist for the New York Post and the Washington Times. Each week, he hosts the Chris Kobach Show, heard Sunday in Kansas. It was a great pleasure to be able to visit with Mr. Kobach and his staff today as we toured businesses, uh, some businesses owned by members of this organization. We were hopefully able to give him a small taste of some of the wonderful things our community has to offer and to show him the potential that we possess. We are a community serious about making a difference in society by promoting moral virtue and as it follows by being good citizens. We hope we're able to convey this during our brief visit. On behalf of the St. Joseph's Businessmen's Association, I would like to extend our thanks to Mr. Kobach for taking the time to visit us today and for speaking here tonight. It is my distinct pleasure to introduce the Secretary of State for the State of Kansas, Mr. Chris Kobach. Thanks, Ben, and uh, thank you, all of you, for uh, being here. Sorry about our, our being a little bit late, uh, but I promise I do know the two uh, fundamental rules of public speaking, uh, and those are to uh, be brief and be seated. Uh, so I will promise to be brief no, longer, no, longer, no matter how long it takes me. Uh, and uh, thank you, Ben, for the kind introduction and also for being uh, our, our, our tour guide uh, throughout the day. Um, I've had a wonderful afternoon uh, touring and visiting some of your businesses. Um, and uh, it's, it's just really been enjoyable to see, to get to know St. Mary's better. You know, I grew up just, uh, a, a, not quite a stone's throw, you'd have to be a pretty good uh, thrower, but you know, in Topeka, on the west side of Topeka. And um, you know, I, I kind of thought I knew St. Mary's, but I just, you know, spending some time with uh, folks here today, it's really made me understand this community so much better. Um, and, you know, I think you'd be hard pressed to find a community anywhere in the country that is so held together by both commitment to faith and by entrepreneurial spirit. I mean, if, th if you think about it, I can't think of any place in Kansas, certainly, where this unique combination of, of faith and entrepreneurialism is so alive and well and thriving uh, as St. Mary's, Kansas. It's really an amazing thing. Um, and, and what a wonderful rebirth the community has seen uh, in the last, uh, you know, 35 years or so. Um, I remember uh, my... my I grew up, uh, my dad was a, uh, a car dealer in, in Topeka. Uh, he had the Buick and GMC dealership there. And uh, he was an avid hunter and he got me into hunting when I was, uh, well, back then you could only start when you're age 11. Nowadays I'm starting my girls as soon as they can hold a gun. Uh, but we would, but I remember driving through uh, St. Mary's in 1977 when I first started hunting and we hunted a lot around here. That was back when the quail were everywhere. Some of you remember those days and uh, you could limit out by noon. But anyway, I won't digress on that. Uh, anyone want to talk about hunting? Just ask me questions about it. Um, but uh, so I remember driving through and, and the, the, the college was closed at that time. And I was always curious about this incredibly beautiful campus and we knew it was closed and I just that was my, my dad and I would talk about it and didn't really know what exactly was happening but then of course you know that a year later um, a, a wonderful rebirth began and that rebirth has shaped this community and brought so many people to this community and has reinvigorated the people that were already were in this community. Uh, and so you, it's just a, an amazing success story, not just for the individual businesses, uh, but for saying you have this campus just so alive and well and full with kids and the Holy Spirit and activity and energy and the businesses in town. Um, of course, you still have some uh, businesses that, that have survived uh, through all the years, but you have so many new businesses that are, doing, that are not just doing well in Kansas, but are doing well nationally. And let, let me give you an example. I heard about Onyx through uh, a contractor who told me about these amazing showers, and I didn't ask, and, I, and I, you know, I went to the website, and I, I, this, is, this is incredible. Then I learned it was in St. Mary's, and I was like, wow, you know, this is something that is a nationally known industry leader right in St. Mary's. Uh, similarly, you know, um, Livewatch, formerly Safemark, uh, that's right, make, make sure we get the branding correct here, uh, you know, is giving, giving ADT a run for their money. 
again, right here from St. Mary's, Kansas. Um, Patriot Outfitters, a you know, chain model uh, or a franchise model uh, gun and ammo store. St. Mary's, Kansas, and doing really, really well. You go from one example after another. And, and of course, Ben's family and his dad and, and businesses. Just extraordinary success stories right here in St. Mary's, Kansas. It, it's, an ex, it's really, really incredible. And, and I think it's more than just you know, a few good ideas here. It's, a lot of it has to do with faith, values, ethics, um, and, and, and so many other things. But uh, I want to talk about two things tonight, two general topics, and I'll answer your questions on anything under the sun. Um, if I, I'll, I'll give you an answer. I don't know if it'll be the right answer, but uh, business, business and the state is my first topic. I'll just give you a few thoughts on that. And then elections in Kansas, because I think everybody has an interest in elections. Uh, whether you're running for office or voting, uh, you have an interest in elections. So I'm going to talk about those, to those two topics, then open it up to you. Um, I am a big believer in small businesses and startups. And again, St. Mary's, a, 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 the, the poster child, so to speak, for small businesses and startups. Again, I'm, as I mentioned, I grew up in a small business family with my dad's dealership. Um, I have a small business on the side, a law practice that I now is just relegated to my, um, to, to, to my spare you know, spare time, because obviously uh, my, my full-time job is Secretary of State, but I still maintain a handful of cases uh, in my spare time. Um, I want Kansas to be the number one state, the number one small business friendly state in America. And I think that is a reasonable objective. And I think we're actually pretty close. And I think many of you would agree we're, we're pretty close already. We're getting there. We are, we are a small business friendly community. But I want us to be number one. And I think it's a reasonable objective. And I think you can measure these kind of things. The, the Tax Institute publishes its annual report of small business friendly states. And, um, or, or no, there's not small. There's business friendly states. Uh, and there's uh, currently ranks Kansas is number 20. We've moved up a few spots in recent years. I think, I think we're better than 20. I think we can easily hit 10 if, uh, if people in government commit themselves to this because unfortunately uh, it's government that gets in the way. Uh, the number one job is, if, that government has as far as business in my mind is just get out of the way. Stay out, be absent from what business owners have to worry about and have to do, and just get out of the way. There's so many people in government who just want to meddle. They just want to engineer things. They just want to, they're thinking they're making things better. They're thinking that they're improving things, but in fact, they're not. They're not subject to the same market forces that the business is, and they're not doing things that actually improve either th the situation for the consumer or for the business owner. And so I think the number one job of, of, of government when it comes to business is to get out of the way. Um, but I think we can do better than number 20. I think we can be number one, which is currently held according to the National Tax Institute by Wyoming. I say, Wyoming, look out. In a few years, uh, we're going to be there. So what can I do? Well, I, I've done, since I became Secretary of State in 2011, elected in 2010, I took office in January of 2011, and the time has flown, but it's already been uh, going on three and a half years since I've been there. Uh, I've taken that approach to our office. And, and the Secretary of State's office is actually the first encounter with government that a startup will have, right? You come up with your idea, you put together your plans, you raise the capital if necessary, and you may even do this before you start raising the capital. You'll, you'll form a corporation, or you'll form an LLC, or you'll form a partnership or an S-Corp, whatever. You will form your business company and that company will then be registered with the Secretary of State. And you do that for a number of reasons. For legal protections, you do it uh, to preserve the name so no one else can, uh, can, can steal your name at, at some later point. Um, and my thought is, I want to make forming a business as easy as possible and as customer friendly as possible. Because a lot of people have questions. I'll bet many of you had this question when you started your business is, well, what, what do I need to be? Should I be a regular corporation? Should I be an S-Corp? Should I be an LLC? What, what do I call myself? I don't, you, know, I'm not, you might think, I, I'm not a lawyer. I don't want to have to hire a lawyer to get the answer to this question. And so we want to make things simple from our office. So you can make that decision uh, without having to go somewhere else and spend a huge amount of time uh, doing that. So my, one of my first commitments and first steps was to make this office, the Secretary of State's office, as customer friendly, as business friendly as possible. And that means providing answers providing real people at the end of the phone line so that you're not just you know, going through an endless series of recordings trying to talk to someone and, and 
just being nice, being, being Kansans to people and uh, giving them the answers they need. And I'm happy to report, we just got some statistics out, and th this really excites me. I, I, I like numbers, and these numbers are good ones. Um, as of, I think these numbers came from February of this year, 85% uh, of the people who call in to our business services office uh, get their issue resolved, their questions, their problems, whatever they have, resolved within five minutes on the phone with a real live human being. And 97% get their issue resolved with a real human being within 10 minutes. That's great. I mean, can you think of many other government offices where you get to talk to a real person right away and the, and the person actually is the person who can answer your questions and you can get the whole situation resolved within 10 minutes or within five minutes in most cases. Um, second thing we did, which is just common sense, is we made business filings and reports available online. Before, believe it or not, this sounds like such a dark ages practice, but if you wanted to go find out uh, if, uh, you find out the business filings, get a copy of the business filings information for Onyx. So you, you would have to go and physically go to the Secretary of State's office, ask someone at the desk to go find the documents for you, and then pay for them to make copies for you. I'm serious. That, that's how it was until just a couple years ago. Well, we made all the business documents available online. So you just look at them on the computer, look them up, there's a PDF image, and you can print out the image. Now, this is really important for banks because if you want to get a loan, the bank needs to look up your, uh, your corporate history and records, and they now don't have to spend the time and the money sending someone down to the Secretary of State's office. That's one simple, easy step to make dealing with us painless. Get us out of the way. We want to consume less of your time. Um, another one is common sense with email. I mean, you, you all know how incredibly convenient email is to running a business. Uh, as many of you know, you probably received a, an email reminder this year reminding you that your annual report uh, for your company is, is coming. If, if the due date was, uh, if your particular company is an April 15th due date, that you're uh, coming up to your due date. And we sent these out for the first time. And Lo and behold, we had a record number in March of people who filed their annual reports early. And that just makes it easier for everybody. Then you don't have to worry about if you, if you go delinquent. Um, we had uh, 27,519 early reports filed by the end of March. Great. And all we had to do was send out emails. Cost? Zero to the taxpayer. Just a common sense thing to do. Um, this one, the tech guys and gals in the room will appreciate. Uh, your accountant is probably doing most, if not all, of your business's tax information, and your accountant may be doing your annual report filing. Well, it makes sense if you can have your accountant software talk to our software. So for the first time, we're the first state in America that allows filing through HTML computer language, for lack of a better word. In other words, the, the software, our software will link up to your accountant's software and just fill in the blanks for your company so that he or she doesn't have to type in everything all over again on our website. Another common sense reform, and believe it or not, we're the only state in America that's doing that right now. But again, this is just stuff to get us out of the way, make your interactions with government as short and as painless as possible. Um, another thing we're working on, I wish I could report that it was finished, that we're working on is the Kansas Business Center. Because unfortunately, the Secretary of State's office is not the only office you have to deal with. If you uh, have employees, you have to deal with the Department of Labor. If you pay taxes, which you obviously would, you have to uh, deal with the Department of Revenue. And my vision with the Kansas Business Center is make it a one-stop shop. Instead of coming down to Topeka, have your interaction with the Secretary of State's office be online and get your tax, your, your tax number from the state online and get your uh, identification information from the Labor Department online at one website where you just go to one place and you get it all done. You don't have to like search for different websites and go to different places. It would be finished now, but for the fact that the Secretary of State's office doesn't <laughs> control those other entities. And that's the, one of the things in government. When you have to uh, cooperate and work with multiple government agencies, it just takes time. Um, but if, if we're all under my, uh, under my uh, control, it would, it would already be done because we're, we're just champing at the bit to make that happen. And I think we'll get that done very soon. Uh, so uh, what are the results? So we've done these things to try to streamline things in Kansas. And of course, there's another big thing we've done I'll get to in a minute, and that's our tax rates. Um, have we seen any results? Well, we have.
for the first time right now in your state, that means that eventually they'll be employing more people. Eventually they'll be generating more revenue. But this is a, a real leading indicator. A business just formed. A business was born. And, uh, and, and in my mind, at this point, government just needs to get out of the way. Let the business do their job um, and, and, uh, and, and, and make jobs, make money for its owners, and, and, and do what the business is setting out to do, whatever that mission may be. Um, okay, but there's one more part of becoming the most business-friendly state, aside from regulations getting out of the way and, and, and interactions with the state becoming easier, and that is government has got to get smaller, and more specifically, the tax bite has got to get smaller. As you know, Kansas did something really terrific in my mind. Some people may disagree, but I think it's wonderful. We re massively reduced our income tax rates uh, with a top personal income tax rate coming down to 3.9% from the mid fives. I think that's wonderful. Um, I don't know if anyone in this room agrees with me, but I think we need to get to zero in Kansas. I mean, you, know, you look at the states that are at zero and you look at their economies, Oh my goodness, Texas, Florida, they are taking off. Wyoming, <laughs> they are taking off because of that zero income tax rate. That is the number one driver of their business growth. Now, we already did move to zero for LLCs and S-Corps, but I think we need to go zero across the board, including for personal income tax. And if we achieve this, Kansas will be, have done something truly amazing. Kansas will be the number one, the only state in America to have gotten to zero from a positive number. In other words, from actually having an income tax. All of the zero income tax states that exist have always been zero income tax states. Nobody has actually moved the ratchet backward and gone down all the way to zero. I think it is possible, but it will take a huge amount of political will to make it happen. Because you have to convince politicians and people in office that they can get by with less money. <laughs> that's, a hard, that's a hard sell. It's not a hard sell with me, but it is a hard sell with a lot of politicians who just look at those budget numbers and think, oh, we can't, we can't shrink. Yeah, you can shrink. You've got to shrink. That will make our state better. And, and, and that's my vision for how our state moves there. And I'm, doing, and, my, and I'm putting these words into practice in my own agency. Uh, one thing I set out to do when I took office at, at the beginning of 2011 is I said, let's see if we can just keep our, our, um, our budget flat. I, didn't, I told my staff I don't want any of our budgets to be bigger than 2010. And I'm not talking about 2010 adjusted for inflation, which is the way government really talks all the time. No, I'm talking actual 2010 dollars. And so far we've done it. Every single year has been below our 2010 budget that my predecessor was operating under. And I don't intend to ever go above 2010. I mean, the government, can, private business can do that. If you guys need to tighten the belt, you can do that. Why can't government? So, but unfortunately, most people in government do not think that way. They do, they do not even think in terms of zero. They might, if they're really, really aggressive, think in terms of, okay, we'll allow it to grow for inflation or we'll allow it to grow for inflation plus uh, the number of people moving into the state. I say zero. Don't grow at all, because I want, over time, government to shrink. The other way you do it is you've got to reduce the number of employees. We have, since I took office, reduced the number of employees in the Secretary of State's office by 14% in three and a half years. How'd you do that? Did that mean old Kobach have to fire a bunch of people in a heartless way, as the liberal uh, editorial pages would tell you? No. We didn't have to fire anyone. Two words, baby boomers. People are retiring. And my view is, when someone retires, see if you can not fill that job. See if you can reallocate the responsibilities, use technology, use the internet, somehow find a way not to fill that job. And then you don't have to fire anyone. But the government shrinks through attrition. And that's what we're doing at our agency. Or if somebody finds a better job in the private sector, and there are lots of better jobs in the private sector, let them go, and then don't refill the position. It is so easy for government to shrink. But somehow, uh, President Obama hasn't gotten that message yet. Um, where Washington is, of course, just this expanding community, and there's so much money floating around Washington, so much building being done in Washington. I was, jo I was at a conference of secretaries of state um, <clears throat> in February, and I went jogging uh, on the mall, and, you know, I. I, I'm jogging down the, onto the mall, and I see this massive new building going up. And I'm thinking, wait a minute, 
I thought we were in a time of tight economic times and government was trying to find ways to cut budget. No, they're building a huge museum. It's going to be a multi-billion dollar, I don't know, it'll probably be hundreds of billions by the time it's over, uh, museum uh, for, oh, some, as it always is in Washington now, you have to, I think it it's, might be African American history or some other ethnic group history, but it's just like now, it, Look, we've got plenty of museums in Washington. We don't need to have another politically correct driven project that is going to be costing taxpayers billions of dollars. But here they are building at a time when the rest of the country is trying to find ways to tighten the belt. The taxpayers can't afford it. We don't have that money. We're borrowing money from China to build that building so that our kids and grandkids can pay it off. Would any business do that? When, when it's not, you know, if, if it's to fight a war, or it's something we, we really need to spend the money on that it, or, you know, to, to secure our nation's borders. Oh, wait, we're not interested in that, in that anymore. Um, something we're really interested in. Yeah, sure, we'll spend that money. But a museum's a luxury. And we got a lot of them in Washington. Anyway, um, government has got to shrink. And the, the, the formula is an easy one. Attrition through retirement. Just let, the, let government get, get smaller. And if Washington would commit itself to that, we would be in such a better place in America. Um, and we'd be, better, we'd be more secure as a nation. Uh, we'd be more secure economically and militarily, politically. Um, but no, that's not the way they're thinking there. So anyway, those, that's my, my talk on businesses. Let me now talk a little bit about elections. Um, as you know, the Secretary of State's got two big jobs. Uh, and then lots of little jobs. We're like the utility infielder of government. Uh, whenever the, uh, we, we regulate everything from notaries, notary publics, I'm like the notary in chief. Uh, that's a big, big job. Um, and if you need anything notarized, I can do it. Uh, and we're also, but, but there's lots of other stuff. Cemeteries are regulated by the Secretary of State. Who thought? Cemeteries? Yeah, we're regulated by cemeteries, uh, the Secretary of State. I'm Secretary of State. Um, and the, what happens is basically whenever the legislature decides that they need a government entity to regulate something, uh, nine times out of ten, they'll say, ah, give it to the Secretary of State. So we have this hodgepodge of little jobs, but the big ones are business filings and uh, run, the, being the chief administrator of elections. And it, elections is a, a really important topic. It's very important for any uh, republic like the United States. And when I came into office, my objective was to make Kansas the toughest state in America to commit election fraud, period. And, you know, we were blessed, or I believe blessed to have um, leadership, all of the same party. So we had a Republican governor and uh, Republican houses, in, and, uh, and then I came in as a Secretary of State committed to this goal, and I ran on that. If it, some of you may have seen my highway signs. They said, stop voter fraud. I wanted people to know that's what I was going to do. So that if they didn't like that idea, they could vote against me. And if they liked it, they could vote for me. And I could tell the legislature, hey, this is why they elected me. Now, here's the bill I gave. And here's the bill I have. And that's what I did. In 2011, we, became, we, we put together the Secure and Fair Elections Act. We became the first state in America to combine photo ID at the polls, equivalent security for mail-in ballots, and proof of citizenship for newly registered voters. First state in America to do all three things. I think that's great. And, you know, they're all common sense things, too. I mean, photo ID, despite the moaning and groaning you hear from some people, I mean, everybody's got a photo ID. Is there anyone in this room who's aged 18 or over who does not have a photo ID? Of course not. Everybody's got one. I mean, it, this is the society we live in. You need a photo ID to get on a plane. You need a, a photo ID to buy anything uh, that, that might be remotely considered dangerous by some, whether you're talking about cigarettes or alcohol, uh, or uh, if you live in uh, Illinois, you need a photo ID to buy Drano. Um, some, some of our former Chicago friends will uh, appreciate that. I don't know exactly what they did with Drano to people. In, uh, I, I don't think I want to know. But, um, but no, you, you got to buy anything. You got to have a photo ID. If you want to buy, buy the kind of Sudafed that works, you have to buy a photo, present a photo ID at the pharmacy. You can get the other kind that doesn't work, but you, you need I'm, no Sudafed reps here, right? I mean, but to, the, you have to have a photo ID. And so the idea that we would be afraid of protecting our most precious right as citizens with a photo ID uh, is ludicrous to me. So anyway, we got that done. Um, Really amazing results on that, by the way. Let me just give you some, again, I'm a numbers guy. I like these numbers. Let me give you a picture of it. So the, what you heard from the people who are anti-photo ID, which is mostly the radical, radical left, what you heard was that, oh, hundreds of thousands. They, they actually literally claimed that hundreds of thousands of Kansans would not have a photo ID. Well, this is, these are the facts. In the 2012 presidential election, 1.2 million Kansans voted. 
1.2 million. Oh, and by the way, that number is exactly, the, and it was 67% roughly, which is exactly the same percentage of the last time we had a presidential election with no U.S. Senate candidate on the ballot. And, and, and of course, our presidential elections do not have gubernatorial races because they're offset. So that's how you compare apples to apples. You look at the last time you had no Senate candidate, because there's no statewide campaign you know, doing its own voter push, because presidential campaigns don't push voters to the polls in Kansas, because everybody knows Kansas is going to vote Republican, right? Last time we, since 19. 64, every election, 40 years, we vote Republican. So anyway, same percentage of people turned out. So it was clear that people were not staying home for lack of a photo ID. Okay, now, now let's drill down further. Of those 1.2 million people, 838, 838 uh, did not present a photo ID when they voted. Okay, now under our law, the, you can get a free one. Uh, if you're over, if you're 65 or older, you can use an expired one. You can use that favorite driver's license when you looked really cool back in when you were 20 years old. Um, you can do whatever you want. But the uh, but 838 didn't bring an ID. Now they have six or nine days, depending on the county, to bring in their photo ID after the election to make it count. And roughly 300 of them, I think it was 306, did so. They brought in their ID later. Now the reason all of them didn't, or the uh, higher percentage didn't, is of course they're in this unusual position of being after the election, they already know that their guy or their gal won the local state rep seat by 3,000 votes. And so they're going to say, well, probably doesn't matter. I'm not going to bother or, or lost by that many votes. So they, you know, a lot of people won't bother to go in because they know that the margin was so big. Anyway, uh, so that leaves about 532 uh, people who still didn't bring in the ID. Well, we knew their names. So we, my office, we talked to the DMV and we said, could you please check if these people have a driver's license? Turned out that all but 30 of them have a driver's license. So they could have brought the driver's license, they just chose not to. So then we drilled down even further. Well, with the remaining 30 or so, what about those? So we sent them questionnaires to say, do you, we'd like to help you. Do you have any IDs? What do you, here's a list of things. Do you have these? If you don't have them, we're gonna get in touch with you and help you get one, because you can get it for free. Um, after that whole process, we found only two people that we know of in the state who actually didn't have a photo ID. And those two people could have gotten a free one if they wanted to. Not 300,000, like the far left was claiming, two. So, you know, numbers actually tell a pretty good story and show that, that what we all know to be true, that pretty much everybody has one, is in fact uh, true. Um, so what about the other part? of the Secure and Fair Elections Act. Um, proof of citizenship. You might have been reading about this in the press a little bit lately. Uh, proof of citizenship. We are one of four states that has only four states do this. These are the cutting edge states that are really trying to make it impossible to commit voter fraud or as nearly impossible as we can. Um, those states are Georgia, Kansas, Arizona, and Alabama. And by the way, other states are copying us. Alabama adopted our proof of citizenship part word for word almost um, after we adopted it. And Pennsylvania, by the way, has adopted a version of our uh, provision securing absentee ballots, uh, mail-in ballots. So we really are becoming the model. And that, that's my objective because, you know, just making elections secure in Kansas is great, but I'd like other states to do what we're doing. You know, and that's the way the founding fathers envisioned it. Laboratory of democracy. One state does something that's good, you know, Wyoming's doing a lot of good thing for businesses. Let's do what they're doing. Let's get out of the way and thrive. If Kansas is the number one state in stopping voter fraud, I want other states to do this too. Um, I just talked to the Secretary of State of Mississippi. They're thinking about joining the group uh, that have proof of citizenship for people registering to vote. Okay, so what's going on there? Well, you might have heard in the press that Secretary Kobach has suspended the voting privileges of 16,000 people. How dare he? Well, the actual, where that actual number comes from is that our proof of citizenship law was written in a very permissive way. So if you want to register, you want to fill out a card at a voter registration drive, maybe out on, on the main street there on, on 24, if someone has one or whatever, at a voter registration drive, you can fill out your card and you can send it in. But if you don't have your passport or your birth certificate handy, you can send that in later. So we allow people to have a gap in time and you can send it in a day later a week later, a month later, a year later, 10 years later. There's no limit. You can send it in whenever you want. So people can procrastinate if they wish. And you know, people are people and a lot of people do procrastinate. So that 16,000 is actually people who just haven't sent in the second half. Their, their registration isn't complete yet because we chose to make it easy for them 
because the people on the far left were saying, oh, we need voter registration drives. And so I said, okay, you can have your registration drives. We'll let people take as long as they want. And now they're complaining that people are taking as long as they want. So anyway, no one's voter, voting privileges have been suspended. Those are just people uh, who haven't completed, completed the process yet. And guess what? We're still six months out from a major election. My gut tells me that probably the people who want to vote will finish up. And by the way, every single one of those people has been contacted by uh, mail and also by telephone, at least according to the directions we've given the counties. And as so far, all the counties are doing that as far as I know. So um, it's been pretty good. We're reaching out to the people, we're reminding them, and, and, and they're getting it done. 83% of the people who've registered since the law went into effect have completed it. So if only 17% are procrastinating, I said it's pretty good. So anyway, what about the lawsuits, Chris? Well, there are. In one of the lawsuits, we actually started because uh, the federal government, there's an agency that controls the, you can register to vote using a state form, which 99% of us do. And, but some people use the federal form, which you can get on the internet if you want to use it. And this agency that controls the federal form, they said, we're not going to require proof of citizenship for Kansas voters or Arizona voters or anyone else. So if you use our form, you won't have to provide proof of citizenship. Well, thank you, federal government. That blows a huge hole in our whole law, and anyone who wants to circumvent it can do it. And so we, uh, Arizona and Kansas, in August, we sued the federal government. We sued that federal agency and said, you have to do what we say because I know not many people in the federal government have done this lately, but have you read the Constitution? <laughs> Article 1, Section 2 of the Constitution actually says that the states control the, the states control the qualifications of voters, which is essentially registrations. The states determine who is qualified to vote and who is not. And the Supreme Court has always said the states also control enforcing those qualifications, how you decide who's qualified to vote and who's not. And the number one qualification for voting, citizenship. In every state, you still have to be a citizen to vote. You have to be 18, of course, as well. And so the Founding Fathers put that in the Constitution for a good reason. The states disagreed at the time. At the time the, con uh, the Constitution was drafted in 1787 and ratified uh, in 1788, the states had wide disagreements. In Pennsylvania, you had to be a property owner. You could not vote unless you met the property qualification. You had to own a certain amount of land if you were farming, or if you lived in the city in Philadelphia, you had to have a certain amount of chattel property. You couldn't vote otherwise. Most states did not have property qualifications, but some did. And those eventually, they, before, by the civil, time the Civil War rolled around, uh, the states had gotten rid of those property qualifications. But it was their right to decide who gets to vote. Nowadays, we still have differences, mainly on felons voting. Some states do not allow felons to vote. Some states let them vote from the jailhouse. Um, Kansas, we're in the middle. In Kansas, we say if you are convicted of a felony, you can't vote during the period you're under state confi confinement. So if you're sentenced to 10 years, you know, only spend two years uh, in prison and then the remainder of the time you're on parole, um, you, you, that whole 10 year period, you're disenfranchised, but then you can register again once, once that period's over. So, I, and I think that's the right, the right balance. At any rate, states disagree. And so we have the right as states to disagree, to do it differently and to, and to enforce voter qualifications their own way. So we went to court and Kansas and Arizona jointly suing this federal agency. And on March 19th, we won. We beat with the Obama Justice Department in court, in federal district court, and uh, it was a big victory. The federal judge ordered this agency to immediately change the federal form so that it wouldn't circumvent our proof of citizenship qualifications. That was a big victory. Um, and now, uh, 36 days later, but who's counting? Um, the Obama administration and this agency still haven't complied. Even with the judge's order using the word immediately. Hmm. A lot of things happening in Washington that are kind of distressing, but you have a federal court order and they still haven't complied with it. So with each passing, we just filed a motion uh, last Friday asking the judge to compel them. And the motion, a motion to compel means, please judge, tell them, do it or else within 24 hours. And so we're waiting with each passing day to see what the judge does because I know most federal judges are not used to being <laughs> ignored. <laughs> it's never happened uh, in, in my practice that I've ever seen anyone ignore a federal court order. But hey, this is the Obama administration, so I guess they're different. Um, so that's been really successful. And then there was another lawsuit you might have heard about on our photo ID, and you'll read about in the papers tomorrow, or if you go online to read, you'll, t there's an article that's coming out. Uh, one of them just got dismissed yesterday. It was a uh, 
two plaintiffs, two uh, older gentlemen from Osage County. Uh, they claimed that the photo ID was a imposition on them, uh, but they really didn't have any good legal argument because the Supreme Court of the United States has already said there's no federal constitutional burden on that question. And they were trying to come up with a burden in the state constitution, saying, well, maybe it violates the state constitution. Um, but that's kind of hard to do because the state constitution of Kansas actually says the legislature can provide for proofs of, of qualification to vote. And that's, of course, what a photo ID would be. Anyway, uh, they withdrew their lawsuit uh, uh, on yesterday. And it was, uh, so it's, it just came out in the news today. So you may read about that. So Kansas has already won uh, two of the lawsuits. The third one I, I'm pretty confident we'll do all right into. Uh, so, you know, I knew that this would be what would happen if, when we try to set out to become the number one state in, make, in stopping voter fraud. The first stage would be legislation. That was 2011. Second stage would be implementation. That was 2012 and 13. And now we're into litigation. And that's okay, because I don't mind fighting the ACLU in court. In fact, usually if the ACLU sues, that means we've done something right. Um, and so we're, we're in that stage and we're gonna win. We've got the Constitution on our side and we're doing the right thing. And uh, a lot of people don't like that about me, but I think when we're, you know, I'm, I'm kind of stubborn. And I know a lot of you guys are, and, and gals are kind of stubborn too. When, you, when you've got an idea that works, when you know you're heading the right direction, you just keep on pushing and eventually, you get to where you need to go. And that's what we're gonna do in Kansas uh, in terms of securing our elections. I, I just have a simple way of looking at it. We should make it easy to vote, but hard to cheat. What's wrong with that? We're making it hard to cheat. And that's uh, what other states are noticing and they're copying Kansas. And, and I think, hey, if Kansas can be number one in stopping voter fraud, some people may not be excited about that as they are about number one in NCAA basketball, but I am. I think that's even more exciting than NCAA basketball. The other area that Kansas is uh, number one in, uh, and, um, and, and our Patriot Outfitters uh, may like this, Kansas is the number one state in gun rights. Did you know this? In, in popular appreciation of gun rights. How can he say that? How do I know that? Here's how I know that. Most every state constitution has a provision in it uh, protecting the right to keep and bear arms at the state level, state constitutional level, kind of usually using some wording from the Second Amendment, but usually more broader, more broadly worded than the Second Amendment. Anyway, Kansas uh, put ours on the ballot in 2010 for the popular vote, and a record 88.2% of Kansans voted for the state protection in our constitution of the right to keep and bear arms, 88.2%. That's the highest of any state ever. Second place goes to West Virginia with 83.6%. Nice try, West Virginia, but not even there, not even close. So anyway, I'm happy to be in a state that is the number one state in respecting the right to keep and bear arms and is the number one state in stopping voter fraud. And I'd like to see us someday become the number one state in helping small businesses get started. So thank you very much. And I, I think we've got a little time for questions. What time do we want to get out of here? Well, <laughs> I, I, I know people have better things to do than listen to uh, me speak, but I'll take any questions you have. Anyone? Yeah. Uh, are there, what, uh, what efforts are being made by the legislature to mitigate the uh, destruction caused by Obamacare? Great question. And actually, um, something big just happened on that topic. Uh, was it yesterday or two days ago? Uh, the, uh, the answer is the legislature just took a big step and I was involved in it. Um, and that is Kansas joins the health care compact. So those of us who want to stop Obamacare, first thing we said is it's unconstitutional. Let's just stop it right up in court because the interstate commerce power of Article 1, Section 8 does not allow Congress to force people who are not in commerce, who have not purchased health insurance. How can you say by forcing them to purchase health insurance, you're regulating commerce. You're regulating someone who's not in commerce. And I remember during the, I'm gonna go on a sidetrack here, but it, I, I think it's funny. The, uh, so remember what Obamacare was being debated just constantly in the news, like for like that three month period of January, February, March of 2010, constantly, you know, oh, what's the next thing that's gonna happen in Congress? I remember this interview on Fox News Channel, and, and, and thank goodness for, thank God for Fox News. Um, it's good to have a channel that's out there, it really is fair and balanced. And, and so there was this um, interview with, it wasn't Major Garrett, it was one of their 
reporters. Anyway, he was, he was interviewing Arlen Specter, uh, also known as Snarlin Arlen. And uh, Arlen Specter, uh, as you may know, grew up in Russell, Kansas, and uh, moved to Pennsylvania. He was a Democrat who became a Republican who became a Democrat. And uh, he said, in response to this question, the interviewer said, uh, Senator Specter, you've been on the Judiciary Committee for you know so many years, decades, and uh, you know the Constitution. What do you think of the argument some people are making that Obamacare is unconstitutional? He said, oh, that argument is ridiculous. Pennsylvania, I'm sorry, not Pennsylvania, Massachusetts had something like Obamacare, so if the, they can do it, we can do it. And as someone who used to teach constitutional law, he would have gotten a, an F for that answer in my class. As I'm sure you know, states are, are states of unenumerated powers. The, the, Kansas does not have to look in the Constitution for what the legislature can legislate on. There are certain things they can't do, but there's no list of things they can do. The federal government's different. It's a government of enumerated powers. It's all found mostly in Article One, Section 8. If it's not on that list, it doesn't exist, to paraphrase Johnny Cochran. So the, it, it, that's how the federal government works. If they are a government of enumerated powers. So for Senator Specter to say, well, it's just like Massachusetts. No, Massachusetts doesn't have to find regulation of health care on a list of powers. Well, anyway, it doesn't exist for Congress, and the argument we were making back in 2010 was, look, this is not the regulation of interstate commerce. That's the only power that they were asserting in Congress was re we're regulating interstate commerce. Well, as you know the story, it went to the Supreme Court, and we won. We, the states, won on that issue. It was not a regulation of interstate commerce. It, the Supreme Court, however, um, came up with, I think, a bizarre rationale that says, no, well, this is just a tax, because the penalty is is cloaked in taxing clothing. And uh, as a result, it, was still, it still prevailed. So then a lot of us are scratching our heads thinking, what do we do now? The, this is an obviously unconstitutional bill, yet the Supreme Court has, by a five justice majority, upheld it. And once again, the answer was given to us by the founding fathers, or one of the answers. And that is found in Article I, Section 10 of the Constitution. The founding fathers wrote the Compact Clause. And the compact clause allows state compacts to continue to exist. Before the Constitution, state compacts were really common because the states were sovereign. They were like separate countries for all intents and purposes. And they would have agreements between each other, which were like treaties. And those agreements, those compacts, had the force of law. So they would have compacts about uh, commerce on the Delaware River. They would have compacts about fishing rights, compacts about certain trading agreements. And so the Founding Fathers said in Article I, Section 10, Compacts can still exist between the states, and, and that means still have the force of law, but only if Congress ratifies them. Only if Congress ratifies them, not the president. So an idea started a few years ago. Well, what if the states that are opposed to Obamacare, what if we formed a compact that says this, these states can waive whatever parts of Obamacare we want and we don't have to follow that part of the law because it has the force of federal law. All we need is Congress's uh, consent to do this. We don't need Obama's signature because obviously we're not going to get Obamacare repealed even if Republicans take the Senate this fall because Obama will just veto that repeal. Um, so anyway, Kansas, I, I, so that's why I worked with legislators, Brett Hildebrand specifically in the House, and we put the, the health care compact uh, basically the same language other states had been doing. We pushed it in the legislature, got it through both houses, and it got to the governor's desk, and just yesterday, or the day before yesterday, I think it was the day before yesterday, uh, the governor signed it. And Kansas is now the ninth state to be a member of the health care compact, which says, essentially, that these, if Congress ratifies it, these states will have the power to withdraw themselves from Obamacare if they vote to do so. Now, it's a Hail Mary pass. There are a lot of what ifs, but I tell you, the field downfield is starting to clear and our receiver is in view. Because at this point, if the Republicans take control of the Senate, I, I guarantee the House will pass it. And then we'll just have to see how much backbone the senators have with Republican control. We could pass that thing. And then we would actually have the power to regulate health insurance within Kansas like the Founding Fathers intended. You won't find the word health in the Constitution. You won't find the word insurance. You won't find the word medicine or health care. This was always supposed to be a state power, and we can take it back through a state compact. So we did just do something that I've been pushing for, uh, you know, joining the health care compact. So we're the ninth state to do so. The other states, I don't know if I have them all memorized, but they're um, some of the southern states like Alabama, Georgia, uh, South Carolina, Utah, uh, Oklahoma, Missouri, 
uh, one of our neighboring states. That's most of them. So anyway, a uh, group of states, uh, Indiana too, I think, uh, joined the compact. So we've got a group of states that are sitting pretty right now. And if, and if the a compact is actually ratified by Congress, I think there'll be 41 other states that are knocking at the door before too long. <laughs> yeah. I think it was about 18 years ago, and uh, Pat Roberts made one of his few trips back to Kansas, <laughs> and uh, I, can, I, I confronted him on a vote he had made, I won't tell you what it was, but uh, I said, that was unconstitutional. And he said, he, he, was a, he, he right in my face, he says, everything we do in Washington is unconstitutional. <laughs> And that was a defense? One of the people who was right there with me is having to be in the audience today. But I mean, we've got to get rid of that guy. Well, the, 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 the the question you asked him was the right question, and it's the question that every member of Congress should be asking themselves. Yeah, to, de to defend the Constitution. And as you know, when Republicans took back the, the House of Representatives uh, in the 2010 election, they instituted this practice of when you submit bills now, you have to say which part of the Constitution authorizes Congress to do this. We should have been doing that for the past 200 years. And you know they also started reading the Constitution portions of it on the floor. I guarantee that if you t quiz the members of Congress on the Constitution, just basic questions, uh, I guarantee that I don't guarantee, but I suspect that the majority of members of Congress would not be able to pass that exam. And it's really not that hard. Just read the thing. And our Constitution, okay, now you're going to get me off on a tangent, but, you know, that's all right. Um, the, and I, this is one of the first things I talk about uh, in my constitutional law classes when I taught them as a law professor. Uh, our founding fathers wanted a tiny, tiny federal government. Um, the... And the Constitution they drafted, I usually have a copy in my, yeah, I do have a copy in my jacket. Okay, so the Constitution they drafted, I'll just keep one of these with you. You never know when you might need one. Um, it, it, it's, it's very short when it, when it lists federal power. And remember, if it's not in the list, it doesn't exist. So it's a government of enumerated powers. Well, Congress has pretty much everything that they find, everything that Congress has is in Article One, Section 8, which is this much of this page and this much of this page. That's it. If it's not on that list, they can't do it. That's pretty much everything. There's a couple of other places where they have a small thing, small powers, but it's, it's pretty much all here. And these are not big powers. These are very narrow powers um, to establish a uniform rule of naturalization. Yeah, I like that one. Um, uh, to coin money and regulate the value thereof. To provide for the punishment of counterfeiters. To establish post offices. These are really narrow powers. And the one that Congress has abused for all these years is the power to regulate interstate commerce. And they really started abusing that. Well, yeah, 1937 is when they turned the corner. And, and that's when, right after Roosevelt threatened to pack the court, and then two justices switched their votes, and, and a six-justice majority started approving these these, law, these laws that had previously been deemed unconstitutional, these types of laws. Anyway, um, it's a very small list. So when James Madison was defending the Constitution, this Constitution, by the way, almost never got ratified. It, was, it came very close to being defeated during the ratification debates. There was a huge worry among the founding fathers that this thing was not going to fly. They would not get nine states to adopt it, to ratify it. So, um, and so the, the Federalist Papers are, are a series of op-eds that were written as editorials in the papers of the day trying to convince people to press their delegates to the ratifying conventions to ratify it. And um, one of the biggest arguments that was made against it is, this federal government is too big. They thought this tiny list of powers was too big. And James Madison writes Federalist 45 on January 26, 1788. And I can imagine him there writing it frustrated, saying, look, it's, it's only this little list. It's not too big. And his words, sometimes I have a quote. Eh, I don't have it in my notebook here, but I can, I can pretty much paraphrase it. James Madison said, all of the powers that are left to the several states are numerous and indefinite. Numerous and indefinite, because again, states don't have to look to a list. The powers given to the federal government are few and defined. Right here and right here. That's all they can do. 
And he said, the powers of the federal government are going to be confined to mostly war, foreign negotiations, and foreign tariffs. And that's where the federal government's going to get most of its, pretty much all of its money, as he thought, was foreign tariffs, because they couldn't tax the people. And the powers of the states will, will control everything, will include everything that affects the lives, prosperity, and economic activity of the people. He didn't use the word economic, but his lives, prosperity, um, and maybe property of the people. Does that sound like the America we have today? Where everything that affects your life is done at the state level, and the federal government's just concerned with foreign affairs? But that's what James Madison, the principal author of this document, that's what, he, that's what he believed he was writing, and that's what the ratifiers believed they were ratifying. And that's how far we have drifted from our Constitution. And I believe states have to stand up. States have to stand up and say, because not only are the people worse off when the federal government grows beyond its constitutional limits, the states are worse off. And the states are the better repository of government power because you can call your state representative. It's Representative Carlson, right? Here. I bet most of you have talked to him or have his phone number and know how to reach him. You can call him and you can bend his ear and you can talk to him and tell him what you think. Congress? You know, good luck getting on the phone with somebody. You might see them, and you will see them. In Kansas, we do have, you know, people, members of Congress who do come around and try to spend time with people. But it's just so much harder because the districts are so huge, or, or even statewide. And uh, that's the genius of the Founding Fathers. They wanted to keep everything at the state level. And so states have to start standing up, like Kansas is, and challenging the federal government, suing this federal agency like we just did, and, and beating them, challenging the federal government by doing this health care compact. Another thing we did last year to challenge the federal government is the Kansas uh, Second Amendment Protection Act, which says any uh, firearm that is assembled in Kansas and never leaves the state of Kansas has never traveled in interstate commerce, so the feds can't touch it. Imagine that. Let's, let's go by what the Constitution says. Every federal regulation of firearm is premised on the idea that they're regulating something in interstate commerce. Okay, if it doesn't leave the state, you can't touch it, feds. And furthermore, we said it's a felony if any federal agent tries to regulate that made in Kansas firearm. It has to be stamped made in Kansas, too. Um, so anyway, I, it, long answer to your short question. States need to stand up, and we need to read this document. Any other questions? Yeah. There's a few states that allow non-resident property owners the right to vote in local elections um, and basically delegate that authority to the municipalities to be able to allow, say, a business owner who owns real estate to uh, have the right to vote, even though his domicile is not within the city limits. Um, I'd be curious to know, has that ever come up in Kansas and what your position on that would be? I'm not aware of any locality in Kansas uh, that has attempted to do that. My position would be, uh, is I'd, I would be against it. And the reason is it, it gets too hard to police people who are double voting if you allow some people to vote in other states some of the time, like in local elections. Um, one of the other things that Kansas is doing, and I didn't even mention this on, on elections, is we, house, we, we host the Kansas Project, which is also known as the Interstate Crosscheck Project. Back in 2007, my predecessor, Ron Thornburg, got together with four other secretaries in Iowa, um, Nebraska, and Missouri, and said, hey, let's start checking our voter rolls and see if anybody's registered in two of our states. And that way we can clean up our voter rolls and take them, you know, start the process of taking the name off of the older state so they can't double vote. Because believe it or not, there's a lot of double voting, especially in the Kansas City area, where people just move across the state line, they get a card saying, oh, hey, I'm still registered in Missouri, and they, and they vote in both states. Um, when I came into office, I took that program, which was mostly a Midwestern program, and made it nationwide. We now have 28 states involved in the program and it's really powerful just this past january we contr we compared voting records of a total of more than 100 million voters from our 28 participating states and we found a huge number of people registered in kansas there are 125,000 people on the kansas rolls who are also registered in one of the other 27 states and get this uh, about 20 of them voted in both states and that's a felony both under state law, oh, no, under state law it's not a felony, but it's a misdemeanor, and it's a felony under federal law. Um, 
so anyway, to your question, I don't support that because I really think we have to police people who are voting in one state and in another state, and it would be more complicated to do that if our state, if different municipalities in our state allowed out-of-state residents to vote in both. But the state statute could require that you are a resident of Kansas, so... I'm oh, oh, sure, yeah. As long as you're a resident of only one state, that's fine. out-of-state voters, so, I, for example, um, I own property in St. Mary's. I am impacted by the city government daily. Oh, I got you. I'm sorry. I thought you were saying an out-of-state no, no, voter. No, I live, but I live outside. But the state has to give the municipalities that authority by by passing legislation to allow them. Uh, in, in Kansas, the city of St. Mary's could not allow non-residents of the city. Sure. Okay. I'm, I'm, when you said non-residents, I thought you meant non-Kansan. Non-residents of, of a municipality, so a non-resident property owner. Yeah, I wouldn't have I wouldn't have any fear of voter fraud then in that case because you're not talking about out of state, but the only and you're talking about only municipal elections too. Um, thinking about this for the first time, actually, uh, the only question I would have would be administration of it, so that we, so that the county. I mean, basically, the the burden for administering that would be on the county level, right? So the the counties administer local and county elections, and so if the county were willing to undertake that burden, and there would be some burden in terms of the county clerk having to identify eligible voters outside of his or her normal jurisdiction that could be made to work um but before i say i'm 100 percent okay with that i want to check with staff and check it see if there are any kinks i don't know about it because it, it's an amazing you'd, you'd be amazed about how how complicated the you'd think elections are just simple things right you cast your vote you're done you count them but there, there are lots of twists and kinks to it that i'd, I'd want to make sure i'm familiar with yeah thanks for thinking about that. yeah property in just as an example yeah St. Mary's, but don't live in st mary's and it would be nice to be able to vote right in those municipal elections uh for the people who are actually impacting yeah the business well one the thing i know is you'd have to only have you couldn't be declared a resident of St. Mary's in that situation. You, you have to have one residence under state law, and it would be hard to change that aspect of state law. But um, let me think about that. As far as the you know having a non-resident of a municipality who still lives in the county, for example, that would make it easier if it was in the county to be able to vote in that municipality. That is something that actually probably could be done. If you start crossing county lines, then it gets harder because county each county administers the elections within its county. So if you kept it within a county, it would be much easier to do. Other questions? Yeah. Your thoughts. Uh, now the way I understand it, two, twice the, the Kansas State Supreme Court, via lawsuits on funding schools, yeah. has directed the legislature to levy or spend money in a certain way. Yeah, it, it's outrageous. Um, yeah, in, in the Montoy suit of 2005 and now the latest suit this year, um, the Kansas Supreme Court has ordered the legislature to spend X number of dollars. And nowhere in the Kansas Constitution is the judiciary empowered to tell the legislature how much to spend. Um, the legislature has that authority. Indeed, the power to appropriate and spend money, is, to appropriate money is expressly given to the legislature in the Kansas Constitution, solely to the legislature. And the Kansas Supreme Court did this by distorting two parts of the Kansas Constitution. In, 19, in, in 2005, they did it by distorting the suitable provision clause. There's a, you probably heard the word suitability when you read these articles about what the court's ordering us to do, the legislature to do. Uh, there's a provision that the drafters of the Kansas Constitution put in there and it says this, the Kansas legislature shall make suitable provision for the funding of public schools. Now, you don't have to be a lawyer or some historian to understand that. That just means set up a system to come up with school funding, right? Set up a, a system of property taxes and other, at the state or local level and come up with a way to fund schools. That's all it says. It doesn't, but the way the Kansas Supreme Court misinterpreted it and twisted it, twisted it beyond recognition was to say, oh, that means we, the court, get to decide what is a suitable dollar amount to be spent per pupil by the state. That is not what it says. And they say provide for a suitable education. No, it doesn't say a suitable education. It just says come up with a suitable way for providing for schools. Um, so they did that one, and they just butchered the Kansas Constitution when they did that. And they ignored the part that says they can't, only the legislature can decide how much money to spend. And then with this latest decision, um, they used an equity provision of the Constitution, um, you know, claiming that, that equity, which means fairness, requires 
you know, virtual equality in, in state dollars spent, and oh, by the way, that means you're gonna have to spend more money. And again, that's a distortion of the, of the term equitable in the, in the Constitution. They, they are assuming for themselves the power to spend our money. And there is a reason that the founding fathers of the US Constitution vested this authority principally in the House of Representatives and also in the Senate. And the framers of the Kansas Constitution put it in the legislature. You can vote those guys out of office if they spend too much money. That's why, because they're spending your money. And I expect that people in this room, a lot of you are particularly keenly interested in that because they're spending your money to pay for schools you're not sending your kids to. And you know, I, as a homeschooler, I am, our, in our family, I'm keenly aware of this too. And so, look, uh, there's a reason why it was structured this way, so that you could keep spending under control at the state level by voting out people who want to spend too much of the taxpayer's money. And what's the answer? I wish I could say there's a silver bullet. The best answer we have is to change the way we select justices of the Kansas Supreme Court. We have one of the most, we are a red state, but we have one of the most liberal Supreme Courts in America. And the reason is that in the 1950s, Kansas adopted the Missouri plan, which should have been our first clue that it was a bad idea. <laughs> the Missouri plan, is named after the state of Missouri's system for appointing judges. They came up with a so-called nonpartisan merit selection commission, which is neither nonpartisan nor does it result in higher merit in judges. It's a commission that operates mostly behind closed doors and they decide which choices they are going to give to the governor. And he can only choose from among those people. And so he can decline and they can give him more choices. But the, the point is the governor doesn't get to pick who he, who he or she wants to uh, appoint, whom he or she wants to appoint. And uh, as a result, this commission, which by the way is controlled, the majority of the seats on the commission are controlled by lawyers and lawyers are, uh, your present company excluded, mostly liberal. Um, so they have this liberal plate of justices that are selected, and that's why we have such a liberal Supreme Court. A, and, and by liberal, I particularly mean activist. So they are assuming for themselves powers that they do not possess under the Kansas Constitution. And, um, and consequently, they're just doing things that cannot be supported. And I don't think any fair legal reading would come to would agree with that, what they're doing. So anyway, that the, the solution is we need to change the way we select justices, go to the federal model, where the governor appoints, the executive appoints, and then the Senate confirms. Why is that better? Because then the governor has to put his or her political reputation on the line. You've got to stand behind that man or that woman that you want to put on the Supreme Court. If you pick a bad candidate, it's your political neck that's on the line. And then the senators have to do the same thing. You're going to have to either vote yay or nay on that senator. And so it makes it open. And people are accountable, and they can be held accountable for the choices they make. And that's why I believe, uh, for all of the problems that we see in the federal judiciary, the federal judiciary is a, of a higher caliber than the Kansas Supreme Court. Um, and they are, there are fewer activists, although there are still plenty. Um, and the Kansas Supreme Court needs to be, the way of selecting those justices needs to be changed. Yeah. I'll probably take, I'll take one more just because we're hitting the nine o'clock hour and I know you guys have something better to do than listen to me all night, but go ahead. I have to say that I was very disappointed uh, in the Montoya decision in the Republican legislatures just completely caving in and even bragging that they voted more than what the judges demanded. In, in, Instead of having the backbone to yeah. Um, they could have and they should have, and I 100% agree with you that um, that we should have taken a firmer, I, I wasn't in the legislature, but the legislature should have taken a firmer stand. In fact, I testified in front of the legislature after the Montoy decision and, during that special session and then in the legislative session thereafter saying, here's what I think you should do. I think you should pass a constitutional amendment saying in no uncertain terms that the Supreme Court has no authority to tell the, tell the legislature to spend a single dime. Now, the Constitution already says that, but it says only the legislature shall have the power to appropriate money. But, you know, I should think you should say it in a way that, uh, by the way, Supreme Court, you don't have this power. And we should have passed an amendment back in 2006 to the Kansas Constitution to change the way we select Supreme Court justices, and we'd be that much farther down the road now. Um, yeah, it is a... Uh, it is a shame when something like this happens and more legislators don't stand up and show backbone and say, I'm ready for this fight. It, we're right, they're wrong, uh, the court is wrong in this case. Um, and frankly, I think we should have, 
what happened this year was so many people were expecting the Supreme Court to tell us to spend, tell the legislature to spend $400 million more. And then when, the, when it came back at about $130 million, some of them were breathing a sigh of relief that it wasn't that bad. But they still should have stood up to the court and said, you don't have the authority to tell us to spend $130 million. You don't have the authority to tell us to spend a dime. And so I think that was the dynamic that was happening in the legislature where so many of them were just relieved. That, oh, that's a number we can make it work, um, that they didn't stand on principle. You've got to stand on principle. Our Constitution is nothing more than a, a statement of principles and a statement of rules for keeping those principles in place. And if you're not willing to take a stand on principle, especially when the principle is in the Constitution itself, then I, I don't think you're worthy of the office. You're, you know, you, I think some people run with the notion that they are there just because people think they're really, really smart or really, really wise or whatever, and they're empowered to make whatever decision they want. No, that's not why. You, I don't think most of you vote that way. You don't vote for someone because you think, wow, I think she's really smart. I just let her decide what she wants. I don't care. We put a smart person in. I'm going to go watch football. Um, no, you want someone who's going to represent you and stand for the principles that you believe in. And I would hope that all of us will believe in the principles of our Constitution uh, and that everybody, they swear an oath to it, for goodness sake, in the state and the federal legislatures should support the Constitution. And so I'm just happy to see that in Kansas, you know, despite some of the, the fumbles and the, you know, our legislature is far from perfect and, you know, our government is far from perfect in Kansas. We do have a state that is standing up and actually fighting back on a few issues. And like I say, elections were fighting back. Um, gun rights were fighting back. The prairie chicken were fighting back. We didn't talk about that. Um, <laughs> I, I wrote the prairie chicken bill, which is currently in conference committee, and I hope that it will pass. Um, the the um, a House committee took the teeth out of the prairie chicken, even though they don't have teeth. Um, and we're going to try to put the teeth back in the bill, and hopefully it'll get passed and, and signed, but to, to push back against the federal government. Because, by the way, if the lesser prairie chicken is regulated uh, in the same way other threatened species have been regulated, and it's not a threatened species, but fish and, Obama's Fish and Wildlife says it is, but that's another story. So um, it could be just economic devastation for the 32 counties in western Kansas that have lesser prairie chicken habitat as opposed to uh, greater habitat, uh, which actually extends to around here. Um, so states are standing up. Kansas is fighting back on elections. We're fighting back on Obamacare, fighting back on guns, fighting back on the prairie chicken. The states have got to stand up and fight back. And I really firmly believe that. And if anyone disagrees with me on that, they should vote against me because I will continue to push that because I believe that's the only way we're going to save our Constitution is if the states start standing up for the Constitution and for the Constitution al constitutional allocation of power that is described in that great document. Thank you so much for your time tonight. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much, Secretary Kobach. With that, we will end our meeting. Thank you all very much for coming. Feel free to stick around and uh, network as you will. Good night. Thank you. That dinner was awesome.